Okay, so we are welcoming Frankie Reyes and Nwakan Hong, and I am looking on my screen for the thing I need to open. There it is. <laughs> Um, I would like to just do a really quick introduction because basically we're going to hear from both of you more, but um, Frankie earned her BFA from Tyler School of Art, Temple University in 2015. Since graduating, she has worked as an educator at Friends Select School and um, led various student art projects throughout the Philadelphia region, including a neighborhood beautification project at NL Art Center and the Woodmere Art Museum Summer Community Project. When she's not teaching or spending time with her cats, she's working in her studio at Viking Mills. Hmm? So, oh, sorry. How many cats do I have? How many cats? Three. That, I, that's a great first question. That's a good first question. <laughs> um, okay, and then Nwakan, after graduating from Jingdezhen Ceramic Institute in China with a ceramic art degree, Nwakan moved back to her hometown of Shanghai and worked in various startups. Later, she hitchhiked her way through Western China and traveled throughout Southeast Asia. Wow, that is so cool. I'm excited. Why are you making a face? What's up? I forgot that was in a break. <laughs> <laughs> she then decided, well, we'll get to that. <laughs> now we're going to ask about that. She then decided to move um, back to Jingdezhen, the porcelain capital of the world, to resume making ceramics and became a full-time studio potter. A few years later, she moved with her partner to the United States, which took her out of her comfort zone both in life and in art, lacking a studio space, Nwakan began creating small scale work inspired by traditional Chinese aesthetics. And she just moved to Philadelphia and is now moving to New York, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, um, so I'm gonna start by asking you both the question, how and why did you make the brave decision to make your life in art? And because Frankie is closest to me, please, could you go first? Is this a good distance? That's a good distance. Okay. Um, so I was telling Jay-Z, I actually talk about this a lot with my students. Um, normally they're elementary school age kids that are asking me. So I like to start with when I was in elementary school. Um, so I was a super anxious kid growing up. I did not have a lot of confidence, but one area that I did feel really um, sure of myself in was art and art making. And I have a, a vivid memory of getting my first sketchbook in second grade, um, which my mom actually has. I would have brought it, but it's in Delaware at her house where I grew up. Um, and I would, you know, it was the first time I would sit and like do observation drawings. And I think also like drawings of Harry Potter characters. Um, but I felt like a real artist and I would bring my sketchbook to show and tell each week and show my new drawing. Um, and I was just, I was really, it's been a part of my identity ever since, but I was really fortunate to have a parent who nurtured that and teachers who supported that and made me feel like it was an interest that was worth pursuing. Yeah, that's <laughs> wonderful. Um, the word you used yesterday was that your mom made it feel worthwhile. Yes. I think a really good, can you talk a little bit more about, like, what did you mean by worthwhile? How did she like help you know that? Um, she just made me feel like there was something I could do with it. Like that it was important and in its own right. And I would figure out what it was gonna lead to. And, you know, because there were always moments of questioning. It's a, it's a hard thing to decide. That's why <laughs> it, the question has the word brave in it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but uh, she has always been by my side and still still is and still posts on Instagram anytime I <laughs> have a show or, yeah. you know, uh, make a new piece. So. Um, and then you went and you took the train by yourself oh, yeah. when you were in high school. <laughs> Tell us about that. To Tyler. Yeah. So, okay. When I was in high school, I had these dreams of being a big time artist in New York City. And um, I don't think I talked about this with you yesterday, but my the summer of my junior year before my senior year of high school, I did a pre-college summer program at Pratt Institute. Mm -hmm. And I really liked Pratt. I hated being in New York City and 
in Brooklyn and that is where I'd always imagined myself and I sort of had to rethink things but around that same time um, I think in the fall of my junior or senior year of high school I can't remember um, I started taking the train I lived in Wilmington Delaware and I would take the train from Wilmington the regional rail and it would drop me off at Temple's campus and I was taking figure drawing classes with other teens and young adults and we had live models live nude models mm. and <laughs> and I just felt you know I was independent and I had visited Philly I was really familiar with Philadelphia Wilmington is only 45 minutes away but this was the first time I was doing it on my own and something just clicked I fell in love with Tyler um, I fell in love with Philadelphia and I decided that this is where I wanted to be. So I got my BFA in painting and drawing from Tyler School of Art and graduated in 2015. And I've been here teaching and making art since. Excellent. Well, I think we'll we'll talk about how you engage with ceramics when we look at your artwork in a few minutes. Yeah. Sounds great. Okay, thank you. All right, not fun. Okay. Um, how did I make the green decision? Um, it's not much of a decision. Well, I also have to start from my childhood. So my mom was very artistic, is very artistic, sorry. Um, she used to sing when she was doing the dishes. So I always grew up in this kind of artistic household. Um, and I was, I started dancing when I was very, very young. And I loved it. Um, I fell in love with it and I decided I just wanted to be a ballet dancer. Um, so that's what I wanted to do in my life until um, I was, when I was 13, I realized I couldn't do that. So I thought I'm going to stay with the creative environment and I thought I would just work for the dancers who are on the stage. So I wanted to become a makeup artist to serve them. Um, and in order to become that, I have to talk a little louder. Oh, or maybe have it closer. I don't know, but maybe talk a little louder. I just heard that people are having trouble hearing you. I'll make sure I start again. No, 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 no. <laughs> Sorry. Just so, in order to become a makeup artist to serve the dancers, I have to learn how to draw. So I took took up drawing and I and um, took all the tests um, in order to get to these colleges, and I failed again. Um, so I went to the Jingo Jinster Ceramic Institute. It sounds very bad, but that's um, a safety school. Um, and I got yeah, it sounds bad because it's the most important ceramic city in the entire <laughs> world, and it needs <laughs> safety. <laughs> so, yeah, so I got in, and we have to choose a major before before we know anything. So I thought I'm going to end up in Western Cup going as well, just do ceramics. So I chose ceramic art as my major, and then I went to Um After I graduated, I actually didn't want to be a full-time ceramic potter, um, didn't think that was viable, um, so I went back home to do work with startups, but at the end, I still missed working with my hands, so I went back to the agent and do the pottery full-time. Um, and it is a brave decision, but it's because I know that I always have my parents to rely on. They are very supportive in the sense that they keep telling me that if it doesn't work out, I can always go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I've actually been thinking about this this week, like how important and lucky those of us who, you know, who have that feeling that, yeah. you know, if if it doesn't work out, that you could go home or and then there's, you know, people who are encouraging you and we're, you know, we're lucky people that we have that. Yeah. So I want to hear, a little bit about the traveling and how that maybe influenced your creativity. Um, and, you know, a little, maybe I'm interested also to know, like, what does it mean that you're a full-time studio potter in Jing De Jen? Like, what is, what were your days like? But I'm gonna ask you to hold the microphone because I just still can't hear you that well. Okay. What do you want me to answer first? Yeah, that's a lot of questions. How about, um, <laughs> Like, what was it like to be a full-time studio potter in Jing Dijan? What is that? Did you have your own studio? Or would people visit you? Did you sell from your space? Like, how did that work? Um, so there are, so the way I did it was I 
I'm Derek, my partner. He's also a ceramic artist, and we have a giant studio in Atlanta. And um, we just produced. We made our. Oh, you were working together. Yeah, we were working together, but separate. We were firing together, glazing together, but we were making our, our work, separate work. Um, and I would just be throwing, turning every day, and glazing. And I would put these photos on. Shop, uh, on my there's a site online site it's kind of like Etsy um, called Taobao and I would open my own shop there and sell through the internet um, yeah that's, that's how it is it just involves with from the very basics like making the things and then how to market yourself and take beautiful photos of your finger and eventually buy some things mm -hmm. I mean I, I guess it's also interesting from our, you know, I've never been there, but I have a perhaps imaginary view of what it's like there. And there just must be so many people. Yeah, there must be so many people making that it's it's hard to imagine. You know, it must be hard to make your plate within all of those other yeah. makers. But obviously, you were are super talented. Um, and I'm going to pass it back because I want you to talk about. Um, the work, but hold it in your hand. <laughs> Do you, um, yeah, you want to talk a little bit about, and then tell me to go to the next slide when you're ready for me to come. Sure. Um, so these are my old work. This, these are the work that I made in the museum that I was making in the science work. <laughs> um, <laughs> so my, my motivation for making work is actually when I was cooking, um, I would be fantasizing kind of tableware I was putting them on. Sometimes I would just be cooking and then deciding how to make scrap make pottery. And I thought I should just combine the two and that was my niche. Um, so I would take all those photos, stage them and take photos of them and them on my website or my shop. Oh, let's go to the next one. It's all about the lights. Make the food look delicious and hopefully compliments the, the work. Did you get that one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> During the staging process, it's very messy. So, I'm a lot of times I've heard that um, food stylists, it's not edible food. You know, here they're right. doing like they're like spraying things, but where you everything you made, you then would eat it. Yeah, I have to be economical. <laughs> <laughs> To eat it afterwards, otherwise it's wasted food. Right? Yeah. Well, I think that looking at your photo composition and your ceramic and your food is just a testament to how talented and creative you are. So it may you may say the word fail, but we everyone here knows that that this is not failure. This is amazing. We're glad you're here making pottery. Right, right. So um, I included those is because. I am not a very good person to play with color. I'm not very sensitive towards color and I hated decorating. I love the process of throwing and trimming and just play with forms, but I hated decorating. So it's a joy when I discover the simple um, chattering method. So I can just chatter, but there are um, different combinations of that, different combinations that you can use to make your work still unique. Um, so that's why those Okay, so now I'll open your new newer work. Okay, so tell us about when you stopped making human sized things. <laughs> um, there's when I was still, this is still back in Jen. There are some videos that are very popular, people throwing tiny tiny pots. Mm. And I thought it's fun and I was bored with my large size work. So I thought I'll just give that a try. Um, and that is one of the prototypes in my small library in Long Beach, South Bay. So I put those in. And it's right at that point that we, well, my partner was, I had a 
residency at Learning Space Center in Minneapolis, and that's where we moved, basically. So I, um, in Minneapolis, uh, I was able to continue with the small size work um, because I was sharing my husband's studio, and he took up all the space, so I have to go small anyway. <laughs> Those are the work that I made in Minneapolis. The small scale traditional teacher. Doing small energy cuts. Um, this is, um, and then we moved to Alfred in New York, um, and I was super lucky to be intimate with um, Andrea and John Gill. I was working in their home studio, and they also gave me a giant space to work in, um, and I started, continued to develop and just make small clay knots. Slowly, I got bored of just making singular pots because what am I going to do with them? So, I want to put them into small, uh, other situations. And this is, I guess, where the traveling came in. Um, so, I, I did travel a bit in the before life. Um, and the landscape always fascinated me. They're so gorgeous, so beautiful. And I wanted to make something that's similar to that with whatever I could on a smaller scale. And I always felt on a tea table, it's nice to have a, a mountain on the side to use it like a Yosemite mountain. Um, so um, just use simple geometric forms to um, incorporate that as a base, as well as some root levels. And then we moved again to Montana, um, and those were when I was I was um, I didn't know what to do next, so I wanted more structure. I wanted to elevate a mountain because um, all the ones that I made in Alfred was too flat, so I wanted something more breezy. Um, just this is just an experiment, and I have a terrible choice of color. It's not very refined. Um, but I think the real breakthrough hit when the pandemic happened. Everybody was forced to stay at home, and I was really happy to have huge chunks of time to stay at home and do work. And um, I discovered this new texture that I could just use to realize what I wanted to make. And this is um, a series that I had. It also resembles landscape. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Are those colored clothes? Yes. With mason stains? Or? Yes. Yeah. Um, then, and then you switched sort of the, you switched them and made the pots the, the landscape. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's also a, a product of the pandemic. How I was just thinking how cities have changed after people have vacated it. Um, and a lot of places, not exactly abandoned, but definitely have lacks human in interaction, and they sort of return to its natural, not natural, but um, nature starting to take over. And I was reminded with a lot of those abandoned island images or abandoned human made structure, how the trees and grass had outgrown it. Um, and that is what I picture. So instead of a instead of a architecture, I made it pots. And you can see there are tiny, tiny little pots um, on top of them. Um, I kind of want to resemble like a huge flood and washed out everybody's lives. And I was incredibly homesick, so I started looking at Chinese gardens um, because that's where I really wanted to be. And those windows in Chinese gardens are just beautiful, so I wanted to um, recreate them with the tiny forms. And so that's the window series. And 
again, this is also the garden in the series. It's more literal because the pattern that you see outside is an actual pattern that was used in um, Chinese garden. Um, and we hope you can use it as a way to make your garden look more like a place. Beautiful. Thank you. And that's what you're working on later on your entire like shelf. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Frankie and I share a show. Yes, we do. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Oh, well, look at that. <laughs> an extra bonus. Yeah. How we keep your video. Okay, I'm slowly. Also, in my plan is the um, poster child for our small favorite show this year. <laughs> and Dean's very appropriate. So <laughs> we're excited about sharing her work that way. Oh, wait, we didn't see your video. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, All right. so um, we know that you went to school for painting, and then the question is, how did you get interested in ceramics, and how did those two work together? Yeah, so um, I, when I was deciding on my major um, at Tyler, actually, let me, let me go back. So when I went to Tyler, and I don't know if it's still this way, um, the departments were really separate from each other, and you had to take classes um, to figure out what your major was going to be. And then once you chose that major, you were really just in that department. Um, and I did take ceramics. Oh, can they hear me? Yeah, sorry. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Does it sound okay? Well, I guess I can't see anybody, but <laughs> <laughs> virtual thumbs up. I don't know. All right. Um, so what was I saying? Yeah, so once you chose your major, you were really just in that department. Um, and I did take a, a ceramics class and was considering being a ceramics major, but I was being pulled more towards painting. Um, and I, I definitely feel like a painter. I think that was the right decision. I think even in my ceramics, I bring a real painting lens to the work that I do. Um, but so a few years ago, my partner, who I think is on here, Maxie, are you on here? Maybe that's, I'm I think that's here. the big M. Hey. Hello. <laughs> um, Max is also a paint. Well, Max is, we're both just makers. I, I say that we're painters, but we kind of, we do a lot of stuff now. Um, Max, you didn't take a ceramics class at Tyler, did you? No. Mm. well it missed out but um so max ended up taking a class at the clay studio um back in the old building and when he was getting his work back at the end of the the class he joked that he was just making his paintings on clay he's like leave it to me to you know, sign up for a ceramics class and just make paintings. Um, and what he was doing was like creating 
ceramic panels, um, similar to the wood panels that we would that we would make and paint on, but out of clay, and then glazing the <laughs> was impressive um, gla <laughs> glazing the uh, subjects that he would normally paint onto those clay panels. Um, and we had a shared studio at the time. My bio has not been updated. Viking Mills is no longer, so we're not there anymore. Um, but we had a shared studio at the time and he had some bisque um, clay panels that he offered to let me glaze because he didn't know what he wanted to do on them. And I was like, all right, well, I'll try making my paintings on them. And the first few were awful. And I really, I, I didn't like them. I didn't feel like they were successful, but I'm stubborn. And so I kept trying. And I think I sort of, I had to lean into um, the lack of control that I had because I have an incredible amount of control when I'm painting, but this, there just were so many factors that I couldn't <laughs> um, account for. And I also started, um, could you move to the slide with the clay paintings that are on slabs? Let's pass this. Yeah. I also started um, cutting my own shapes, like my own slabs and making them irregular because I didn't feel like they needed to be a perfect rectangle the way paintings are. And so I started thinking about shapes that were close to rectangles, but complemented um the image that I was that I was glazing on there um and so these are some of my what I think are more my more successful uh clay paintings and I haven't entirely switched over although I've I've been getting a lot of joy out of making these these clay paintings um because I think that that lack of control was like a special ingredient that I that I sort of needed and didn't know that I needed um, and was missing in painting. But now I just, when I, when I have a piece in mind, I'm thinking about, okay, do I want this to be a part of my painting practice? Do I want this to be a part of my ceramics practice? What makes the most sense for you know this work or this series? Um, and so it's just sort of like another medium that I've incorporated into my studio, my studio practice. Like I, I thought that idea that you found a way to, to express the different aspects of your practice and the materials, but they're obviously still doors. Yeah. In your vocabulary. Um, so let's talk a little bit about these are your pieces. Yeah. Doors. These are doors, Billy doors. Um, I wanted to start with this series because I think it does a good job capturing what I'm interested in when I'm working um, in terms of materials and also subject matter. Um, all of my work is about Philadelphia and I've been calling my clay paintings like love letters to, to Philadelphia, um, which I feel like is, is pretty accurate. Um, I, so I grew up, I mentioned that I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware um, and my siblings and I were raised by a single mom. And in the somewhat like conventional neighborhood where we grew up, we just as a unit like felt very isolated and didn't really have a sense of community. Um, and I also talked about coming to Philly and having something click when I was in high school and taking those classes. And it was really the first time that I felt uh, a sense of home and belonging. And so I feel like I owe a lot to to Billy and um it's what I make all my work about and I do think there's still that sense of like loneliness maybe in a lot of my my pieces um but it they also try to capture like the quiet beautiful moments too um and these these paintings were very funny because so when I started making um cityscapes I was I was in art school I didn't have a lot of money I thought I was being edgy and <laughs> was going to we were Max and I would go to the Home Depot to get supplies to make our panels 
And I went through like the, the aisles and would gather different materials like spackle and construction materials and started incorporating them into my paintings, mixing sand into my oil paint. I have no idea how archival any of that work is, but um, I was putting a lot of it into my paintings and stapling plastic onto the surface and doing all kinds of things um, that I, I've, I had started to get away from after I graduated because I think I, I thought that I needed, well, one, that I needed to think about my paintings being archival and two, that it was more professional or something to do oil, just oil paintings, um, which I don't believe now. But the Door series was the first series after I graduated where I could do a little bit of everything. There's, I, I treated each, um, each door as its own painting, even though it was part of this big series that I showed um, as a, uh, together. Um, so some of them are just oil paintings. Some of them have mounted paper. Some of them have that spackle and sand. Some of them just have meat oil medium, mediums for oil painting that I use to build up the surface. When you were saying like the sense of loneliness the doorway as a door without people or you know a closed door. Yeah. So much potential and possibilities of going in or going out and mm -hmm. doing art school, I would say where women will see you too. Absolutely. <laughs> um yeah, and I think so you mentioned people. There are never any people in my work, but there's always the suggestion of human interaction and like the evidence of it, um, which is important to me. Um, so but these are, if you want to go back to that, these are um, two oil paintings that I was doing during the pandemic. And um, I was doing a seer. Well, so one of them was part of a collaborative show that Max and I were working on. It was our first collaborative show together. It was beautiful, but it was, uh, it took a lot of work and it was very strange working on it during the pandemic and not knowing if we were actually going to be able to have a show at the end of it. Um, but we did and, and sold a lot of the work. Um, but so the painting on the right, I made where we made he did the plant in the foreground so each piece in that show had a different level of collaboration and so this one was like more painted by me and then Max painted <laughs> painted the plant um that's on the ledge um but the other the painting on the left was also done during the pandemic just on my own as I was thinking of a new series of work and was just like thinking about what what I was looking at while I was teaching remotely um, during lockdown. And it was, I was looking out of windows and into other people's windows, not in a weird way, but like, you know, that was, <laughs> that was kind of what it was. Like we were all right um, yeah. behind. <laughs> well, I was, is that a person? Is that a shadow of a person? It could be. Okay. It's not. It's not. <laughs> Did you want the answer? <laughs> no, it's like the silhouette of dishes on a on a cupboard that they had like next to there. I know a lot of, about. I don't know who lives there. Sorry, that sounds weird that I know their dishes were there, but <laughs> they were. Um, and this is the, well, you already talked about this one, but mm -hmm. I love, like really sense that you're using a Mm-hmm. Mm. Cornice of that house that I look at when I'm in my house. It looms up the street, so I don't know if it's called Philadelphia moment that sunshine collection. Yeah, I think actually because you said that I was thinking about my source images. Would you mind going to that slide? And you said that you have some photos like this too. Oh, okay. <laughs> So all of my work is from photos that I take. And this is, I just wanted to show everyone how I document things. It's, uh, it looks like chaos, but it makes sense to me. Um, so I'll have 
you know, on my walks, running errands, even going to sites now, I'll take pictures. And then I think about the folder that I want to put it in mm -hmm. for later. And so I have ceramic inspo, wallpaper, how, I don't think you can see the paper there, but pattern. <laughs> I don't know. I just make them on the fly, but, um, so when I'm in my studio, I can go back and, and, uh, yeah, rooftops and light dyers. That's one that's very specific, but, <laughs> um, it's a thing. Yeah. So this is that's what my phone looks like. It's lots of folders of photos that I've taken. Sometimes screenshots, sometimes old photos um, from my childhood. Um yeah, actually this is this is a good one. So the I talked a little bit about collaboration with Max. Um, the the painting with the floral tablecloth and the pineapple, that was a collaborative piece. Um, and the little landscape that I've painted in the corner is one that's repeated. You can see in each one of these pieces. The vessel on the left is a collaborative piece with our friend Peyton who runs Cloud Nine Clay in Fishtown. And she was actually the person who was firing our work for us when Max and I were experimenting. Um, which was so generous of her because she had like a legit clay <laughs> ceramics business that she was building. Um, and now that I'm at the clay studio, um, firing things here, but, um, she, she did that for us for a long time. And this was, we worked on some pieces together too. So this was a vessel that she threw and then, um, I glazed on. And this slide was also just about how I'm not um, I don't shy away from repeating imagery and I will go back to a space if I feel like it's important enough. Um, um, I think it, I, I love the, this connection of two and mm -hmm. probably an image that you used one of the ones. So yeah. But also that there anymore and who lived there and why you know what you picked out that wallpaper and what that meant to you know, and how you if now you you're sort of um transferring your collection in any way to three dimensional you know making giving yourself more space yeah and so these started the planters the house planters started years ago actually before getting back in to ceramics and and the clay paintings I uh my best friend from college works at Urban Glass in Brooklyn and she was having a show so she's a uh she blows glass and is also a ceramicist she was having a show where she made glass and ceramic planters and um it was at Urban and the show started with all of her own planters but then she invited people to make planters um from like their their work and bring it and take so you had to bring a planter and take the planter so by the end of the show the end of the month the whole show was then other people's work and those artists had her planters I was like but I make paintings Courtney I I can't what do you want me to do and she's like just make one of your houses so um I use polymer clay and I just baked like I wish I had included images because they're very funny to look at um it's probably somewhere on my Instagram um but I was just making polymer clay boxes that looked like some of the houses that I paint and um putting like succulents in them but now I'm making them yeah I make I can make them in clay your wallpaper pattern yeah. The wallpaper. Right, exactly. So I think I put this after that one because it just, again, it shows how I can take an image and or take a space and um, do different things with that. So this is obviously a more detailed um, look at one of those, those wallpaper houses, the, you know, the remnants of what was left behind when the building was torn down. And I did, um, for this series, I was hand drawing all of the patterns on paper 
mounting them on panel and then uh, clear gessoing the surface to, to prime it for oil painting and then oil painting on top. So the, this is part of that series too. And I did carve away like into the panel on the wood on the left, but then also painted some of that um, wood grain detail. So this is, it's not the front and the back, this is the painting. That's the painting, mm -hmm. yeah, split in half, yeah. This is the bee artist sale. It was, so I um, included this because I did my first tabling event which was so fun and a little scary, but it pushed me to make some functional work um, other than the planters and to, to see what that looked like. And um, I had been playing around with some of these forms. Like we teach slab cups in Claymobile and uh, I was having a lot of fun with playing around with, I look at so many brick textures. If you start, I mean, if you start noticing the brick textures in Philly, like you'll lose your mind. It's just, they're, they're brilliant. They're amazing. Sometimes people are like painting fake bricks on the side of their houses. So um, that's probably a folder on my phone, but I was making brick cups, wallpaper coasters. The cones was something I was playing around with because I think the traffic cones in Philadelphia also have a lot of personality. <laughs> I want to do one. It won't be functional, but I really want to do one that looks like it's been run over by a car. So I'm just going to make it and then smush it. <laughs> um but yeah I I sold a lot which was cool um but I was telling this one is left over and it's mine um I was telling Josie it's so different from a painting show because when you're in a gallery show if you're lucky enough to sell the piece it's great but then it stays up for a month and people can come see it this like people are buying it and they're just walking away with the piece which I know is the idea but I was like making all this work and then I didn't really get to live with it for very long but it was nice that people but other people start using them immediately as well exactly so. other people are using it and then this these are two pieces that are uh, up right now at a gallery in Jersey City called Deep Space um, where I've shown a lot of my work and where Max and I had our collaborative show um, it's an oil painting on the left and a clay painting on the right. Um, it's kind of hard to see the effect of, I, I like kind of holding the clay painting um, and seeing like the way I did not a, um, I did a layer of like white glaze over top. So it's kind of tricky. Um, and the painting, the oil painting on the left, the roof, again, I was playing around with mediums and had filled a Ziploc bag with uh, oil paint and cold wax and was like uh, treating it like piping icing <laughs> onto the surface, so. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so now we've gotten a few examples of both of your work. I would love to um, hear a little bit about what you do. Um, so maybe let's talk about mm -hmm. um, what were we saying yesterday? Challenges and I think okay. I might have fixed it. Try, try leaving it on the table and we'll ask. Challenges and rewards. Challenges and rewards. Um, so I work as an education coordinator. So I manage the school. I do a lot of the scheduling, all the classes. Um, and manage the students. Um, so we have about 600 students this term and everybody who has a question could come to me and I'll figure out a way to resolve it for them. Sometimes I don't have a solution, but when it when I do figure out like a workaround, it's very satisfying. Um, so that's the rewarding part. Um, challenges is just not enough time, never enough time. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, so 600 people can Yes. Ask you a mm -hmm. And plus teachers, plus our own staff. Um, it's quite fun, honestly. <laughs> well, you always um, do a smile, and I appreciate that. It does seem satisfying when the when the problems are solved. Yeah. Are problems challenges. Yeah, I think a lot of the potters are, are problem solvers. 
So when we do get a good mystery or a good question, when you solve it, it's very satisfying. Okay. Um, so I am a Claymobile teaching artist. I'm coming up, or oh, actually I passed a year at Play Studio oh, in good. October. Thank you. Um, it's been just wonderful. It's a total change of pace from being a classroom teacher. Um, it's very nice to come in and get to be the fun thing because uh, being a classroom teacher is incredibly hard. Um, this is a hard job physically. That's one of the challenges. Also, similarly, never enough time to do everything <laughs> you want to you get done. Um, but it's really nice getting to, to connect with so many students through a medium that might not necessarily be accessible otherwise. I know I didn't have access to ceramics when I was a kid. And, um, and the flip side of that is that, you know, you spend six weeks with a group of students and then um, you don't see them after that, which is hard. But I am finding that after a year of being here already, like getting back into this new school year, um, you know, revisiting sites and uh, seeing familiar faces, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. I would love for anyone who has a question. Okay. Um, going on what you just said about um, spending six weeks with the students. So, you're telling the students, and how can you do this to so that they can make more sense of the and if you had any ideas where you can do that, perhaps bring the students into the studio, have mm -hmm. a little event, continue with the work. Because I understand the value of study and if you start it down, then you can nurture the development and development. And we have to act for that they have our time at the our future. So I hope that we as a studio have the to further nurture the ball and nurture and their growth. Mm -hmm. I need to stop a lot of materials that we were doing. Mm -hmm. And I truly value it tremendously. My time here is spent with my life for that. Yeah, that's a really good question. And something I think, you know, we're always thinking about at Claymobile. I, do you want to hear? Um, I guess it's <laughs> how can we continue to support children after we plant the seed, which was really yeah. lovely way to say that. That was a good way of saying um, it. We do have our after school program. Yeah, that's what, and Kayla's here. Kayla, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but you could talk about the after school program. That was something that popped in my head. Um, and the youth program, youth classes. Yeah, so often. <laughs> Claymobile and it's almost 4,000 almost 4,000 students every every year through the Claymobile program. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but so when when we are at residencies, I get a lot of questions from kids about they love knowing about the process, like when what happens to their work when it comes back to the studio. And so many of them ask, can we visit you? And that's um something that like um, you know, I thought about and hope that there's a way that we can figure out um, how to to create space for that. But I think the after school program is something that does that where it's it's just getting started this year. But um, we finished the first I say we I just helped Kayla pick up the kids. Um, <laughs> she was doing the hard work. But um, we can't do you want to talk about it at all, Kayla, after school? Okay. <laughs> Come on over, Kayla. <laughs> I can't remember what we're doing for the second cycle. Yeah, but maybe so, you could just say what we did for the first. Oh, it's okay. I can. Yeah. Um. So we are actually just ending our first term today for the after school program, but. It was 13 weeks and students were able to come Monday through Thursday after school to practice. Um, so that's definitely a lot more time that we would get for a normal Claymobile residency. Um, plus the access to wheel throwing, which has been really fun with students. Um, but right now we're working with students in the neighboring um, place that we're in. 
Um, so the first term was Moffitt Elementary, and then we're switching over to Ludlow. But I think it's the first of its kind for programs that provide more access for students that are interested in ceramics. Um, so yeah, we're starting our new term in January. For today? Yeah, today, today's the last day. So we're doing like a short, small thing for parents. We do have our Claymobile creation show coming up that will kind of display more uh, Claymobile work. Um, but yeah, I'd love to have an exhibition coming up in the future. Yeah. Yeah. And so on Mondays, Kayla, we had a, our Mondays were busy days. Um, we had six classes at Moffitt that we would see, and I was in the AM team, and Adrian and Kayla would take the afternoon. Yeah. So Kayla would teach three classes of Moffitt students in the afternoon and then meet me in the like playground area, and then we'd take a group of after school students, and then she'd keep working with them for after school. Yeah. Um, but it was great to to be there and to to get to um offer that to families. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, we're not just here during the day. There's an opportunity to come back to the studio. And like you said, the access to wheel throwing, I think, was mm -hmm. super. I mean, it, they did a great job with yeah, it. Yeah. So. Yeah, they've been killing it. And it's been, you know, 13 weeks, so a lot of time for growth. And we'd be able to see that too in the work. And, but yeah. That's that's the after school program. Oh, <laughs> we can talk. Yeah, yeah. we can chat about it. Saturday, um, and now this fall, we were able to start our yeah, Saturday program. So there's the drop in workshop every Saturday that we can do. Yeah, from two o'clock to four o'clock for those who are interested. Please come half an hour early. And that's all they do. So we, you know, people bring kids. We ask them to stay with their kids. It's not a job. Um, but you don't have to sign up for a ride. You get yeah, a wonderful experience. Did you have another question? Yes. Uh, Kayla, in your charge of me, what do you need to, to continue to facilitate this program? Yes, Sorry. figuring space, January 12th, 5 to 8 p.m. <laughs> Please come. Thank you. Bye. Happy holidays. <laughs> Bye, Max. Bye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>